from my perspective, if you look at permaculture design, and if you were to pick up any book about permaculture design out there, they're all going to talk to you about some types of principles. And the principles vary. I've seen lists of 64 principles. I've seen lists of five principles. And they vary depending who you read. But they're all kind of pointing us in the same direction. And one that I would think you'd find on almost any list is a principle of resiliency, a principle that any designs we're creating are trying to enhance someone's resiliency. We're trying to say, what are the essential functions here? And do we have multiple ways to get those functions done? Can we, um, you know, potable water is the example I like to bring up because if you don't have potable water, you're not going to get very far, whether you're in an apartment or whether you're in a rural farm in the country. So do you have more than one way that potable water gets to you? If the water stops coming from a municipal system, what's your backup plan? Do you have six bottles in the basement? Great. When those run out, what's your backup plan? Cool. Let's have a, a slow sand filter maybe and a rainwater catchment system, so on and so forth. So we're always looking, any good permaculturist would be looking at resiliency as a key feature of what we're doing. And resiliency in the face of climate change is something that I'm particularly interested in. Um, things we can do in that regard, we can be looking at planting our edges. And when I say edges, I'm talking about climatic edges here. So we can say, you know, we look at the panorama of things that would grow here in this climate really well. And then we'd say, well, these things it's a little bit too cold for. Let's start trying to grow some of those, even if they don't produce here. Let's see if we can get them to grow. How about things that it's a little bit too warm here? It doesn't, you know, we can look at all the different directions the climate could go and start planting things that don't thrive as things are in the present, but might start thriving as we move forward. We can also, um, you know, when I think about the different climate change projections I see, most of that evidence is pointing to not a monodirectional shift, but a shift in all directions. In other words, more intensity of all events, longer drought periods, bigger floods that are more frequent, hotter hots and colder colds and all that kind of stuff. And so I feel like, um, you know, a couple key things, water planning is huge. If you do go drier, it'd be really good if you thought about having some water on hand, having some stored, having uh, systems in place that would sink some of that water into the ground for you. Flood abatement strategies for the other end of that spectrum, right? So to me, those are all key pieces uh, of the resilience piece that, that applies specifically to climate change. Um, I also think, you know, we have scientific projections at this point. We have scientists who put together 50 and 100 year projections for what they think the climate's going to look like across the globe. And we can start to look at what that information is and we can cognitively apply that to our design process. We can say, well, it's looking like we're going to have a warmer average winter as we move forward. Let's start to plant things that, that will be appropriate to that. And, uh, a series of maps that, I, that, that I, I've seen online and uh, I talk about them in some of my presentations done by a group called the Forecast Project, I think. I think. Um, and these maps basically are showing native ranges of trees, where they are today and where you might expect them to be in 50 years. Here's the kicker though. If it was a squirrel, the squirrel would just run in that direction, right? A tree doesn't move though. So it's a generational thing and I believe that we as humans have a role to be involved in that. So. If we're looking at 50 years from now, let's say that black walnuts are not going to be able to thrive and reproduce in the wild and, and really succeed, um, let's say in 50, 60, 70 percent or more of where they are today, we need to look at where the climate is going to be appropriate for them and take acts to help conserve that species by being involved with moving, 